This is the NBC University Theater, bringing you a full-hour dramatization of Nathaniel Hawthorne's brilliant novel, The Marble Fawn, starring Miss Lynn Barry. Nathaniel Hawthorne has been ideally defined as the most distinguished craftsman of the New England School of Letters, the product of a mirthless household and the inheritor of a grim Puritan culture. He spent most of his time in brooding solitude, remote from the major activities of his time. And out of his solitude and his contemplations in the field of ethics came several rare and wonderful books, notably The Scarlet Letter, The House of the Seven Gables, The Blythedale Romance, and The Marble Fawn. Today, from the NBC University Theater, we bring you a dramatization of The Marble Fawn, a work highly invested with symbolism and rich in poetic effect. Here, then, is Miss Lynn Barry in The Marble Fawn. The marble statue stands in the center of the gallery, the clear Roman light shining down from the skylight above. It is a young man, a wild being, bearing in his hand the fragment of a reed pipe. A smile plays about his marble lips, but there is no principle of virtue in his face. He would be incapable of understanding one. He is the marble fawn, carved by the long dead hands of Praxiteles. Neither man nor animal but a being in whom both races meet on friendly ground. His body is of a youth of the woods, yet his ears are leaf-shaped, furred, and capped by tiny points. A creature of the days long past when man was closer to the trees, the grass, the streamlets of the woodlands. Caught in the peak of his wild free dance, he is the marble fawn, left over from an age of nature long since dead. And now, before the statue, stands a young man. A gay young man who throws his head back and laughs with thick black curls dancing about his forehead. Quickly, he takes the position of the statue. And so they stand, the marble form and the laughing young man side by side. Around the pair stand three others. Kenyon, the American sculptor. Hilda, New England girl. And Miriam. It's perfect. The resemblance is perfect. <laughs> Shake aside those curls. Let's see whether you are the fawn to the tip of your ears. No. No, Signorina, I entreat you. Take the tips of my ears for granted. We must find out. Here, Donatello, no. let me. <laughs> None of my race can allow that, Signorina. It is a tender point with my forefathers and me. Your tender point shall be safe then, Donatello. <laughs> shall we move on to the next gallery, Miriam? There are the Da Vinci sketches. No, wait, Hilda. We mustn't leave the marble fawn so soon. He is the same as Donatello. They are one race, the two. Warm, sensuous, living as mankind did before sin and sorrow were planted in his mind. A creature from the time before the stiff cloak of morality covered the naked modesty of nature. Here is eternal youth, eternal happiness. Oh, God. I wish I could forget my life. Or oh, failing that, one day of it. Now the marble fawn stands alone again. Donatello dances on ahead of his three companions. Kenyon the sculptor, Hilda, New England born, daughter of the Puritans, and Miriam, painter, the dark beauty of the ancients, without past, without roots in any land. Where do you come from, Signorina Miriam? Where is your home? You haunt me, Donatello. Let me keep my mist about me. They say strange things about you, Signorina. They tell strange stories in the galleries. You're a daughter of an eastern prince, they say, running from a marriage. 
for a high-born English lady come to Rome for love of art. Tell me the truth, Signorina. Tell me who you are. But Miriam told no one. And all that the world of art in Rome knew was that her paintings had a pagan light, a wild joy that caused the severe fathers of the academies to frown and pull long faces. Now the four, Kenyon, Hilda, Miriam, and Donatello, went to the catacomb of St. Calixtus. They wandered by torchlight through the pathways of that vast tomb beneath the city, studying the frescoes, the holy pictures painted so many years ago on those walls, hewn from rock in some forgotten age. Yes, she, she their padrones in the chapels. Those are the bones of the blessed Christian dead. Hold the torch higher, guys. I see. I hate this. I hate it all. The sunlight, Signorina. Let us hasten back to the blessed sunlight. These bones are too old and too sacred to have ghosts. They should not frighten you. Has anyone ever been lost in here, Guy? Oh, surely, Signor. The first 1,500 years ago, a pagan of old Rome who hid himself to spy out and betray the blessed saints who dwelt and worshipped here. A miracle was wrought on the accursed one. A, a miracle? Ever since that day, he wanders, groping through the darkness, seeking someone to lead him to the blessed sunshine. Thus he will wander till the end of time. <laughs> there, there's a ghost for you, Miriam. He... Miriam. Miriam. Well, where is she? Hold that torch higher, guide. <laughs> Miriam. She was speaking a minute ago. She was in the shadow, Kenyon. She's gone. Tortures. More life. Tortures. No, come, Lee, come. No, no, she's lost. The beautiful one. Signorina. 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 She's lost, Signor. Lost. No, wait. Listen. Here. Here. Here's she, praise God. Hurry, but this way. Miriam? Signorina. There, there she is. Miriam, where did you. Yes, Kenny. Who is that with you? Who is he? A messenger from. I know not where. She has called me forth. <gasps> Holy Mother. The pain. Who is it? I can't see in the dark. Come forward, you. She has called me back into the world. Who are you? How long have you been wandering here? Fifteen hundred years, senor. It is he, the phantom, who sought to betray the blessed saint. Here, hold up that torch. A man's no more a phantom than yourself. Here, let's have a look at him. Inquire not what I am, nor wherefore I abide in the darkness. Holy Virgin. Henceforth. I am a shadow behind her footsteps. She has called me forth and must abide the consequences of my reappearance in the world. And from that day, he followed Miriam through the streets of Rome, through the galleries and the studios of the painters and sculptors, as closely as the shadow he had proclaimed himself to be. All Rome knew his fierce stride as he haunted her through the weeks. But who he was, where he had come from, these they could but guess. Who is he? Why, my model. Or if you like, he's promised to teach me the ancient method of fresco painting, and then I shall return with him to the dark. Or if you prefer a moral story, I am to convert him from paganism. I lose patience. Make up your own tale. He's my shadow and I shall not answer further. Don't ask again. What is he? Man or demon? The signorina is so sad. She smiles no more at Donatello. She was so happy... I hate him. I hate him. Donatello, welcome. Sit down. Tell me the news of the woodland of Arcadia. Your room is so dark, so shadowy. You're afraid, Vaughn? Oh, I fear gloomy houses and the dark. 
Unless it's the dark of the woods, for there the moon steals through. Oh, you are a wood sprite, Donatello. But the world is sadly changed now. You are centuries late, Vaughn. You're alone. The last of your race. I'm glad to have my lifetime while you live. Are you angry with me now? No, no. Here, busy yourself, boy. Look at the pictures. Yes, I... I... I don't like them, Signorina. What? Even though I painted them? No. They're dark and bloody. Women with arms stained in blood. They're not happy pictures. No. What should a boy, a fawn like you, know of sorrow? Donatello, I shall paint a picture in oils. A gay, happy picture. Oh, do, do, Signorina. A dance. A pagan dance. Yes. And I shall want you for the wildest dancer of them all. Oh, Signorina. Will you dance for me someday, Donatello? Uh, 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 and play my pipe. See, I have it here. Uh, I shall sing and dance and play, and you will paint a happy picture. A happy, laughing picture. That's it. That's it, Donatello. I shall call it the Dancing Fawn. No cares, no moral darkness over you. Just light and life and music. It is time. It is time now. Signorina, the specter. You will paint me now. You have called me to the light and you will paint no. me now. No, no, Signorina. You smile just now. It's finished. You're sad again. Oh, me, Donatello. I must paint from the model now. Oh, dear boy, you're shivering. Your face is dark again, as dark as his. It is, I know. Go outside, Donatello. Go look at gay sights, at the sunlight on the streets. I'll meet you later at the Villa Borghese. He waited there through the afternoon in the wild, tangled woodlands beside the Villa Borghese. And he drank in the fresh scent of the grasses as wine. He ran races with himself through the glens, leaping up to catch the overhanging boughs. And then to bring himself closer to the genial earth, he threw himself full length upon the ground and buried his eager face in the soft grasses and scattered flowers. And then, as the fawn of old, he lay upon his bed of nature and basked in the warming sun. Hello. Signorina. Oh, dearest Signorina. I've waited. Full length upon the grass. Tell me, Fawn, where are your friends, the nymphs, the satyrs? Where is your master, Bacchus? <laughs> I'll play my pipe for you. You're happy, Fawn. What makes you so? Because I love you. Should you foolish boy. There are not two creatures less alike in this wide world than you and I. You are yourself, and I am Donatello. I love you. There needs no other reason. Take warning, Donatello. It is a sad fatality that has taken you from your country and placed you at my side. You've been happy till now. Oh, oh yes, signorina. To dance with the contadine, to taste the new sweet wine, to roam through the woods. I've been happy, but never as I am now with you. You live for the moment, Donatello. How long will this last? How long? How long does my tune last, Signorina? Forever. Forever. Child, leave me now. I might make you dread me. Perhaps hate me. Listen to me, Donatello. Leave me, leave me. Then for this hour let me be as he. And tomorrow back to my reality. Back to the dark dream in which I walk. Donatello, 
This hour, I shall be as close to nature as yourself. This hour, I shall be as gay as Donatello. Lead on, Fawn. Lead on till tomorrow. Come. Come dance with me. There's music somewhere in the grove. The concertine. The peasants dance to celebrate the spring. Come, Donatello. Play your pipe. Play his head himself. Play for play. unfair advantage of me. I am no true creature of the woods, while you are a real fun. I do believe I see the pointed ears when your curls toss back. Dance. Dance, senorita. If we take breath, we shall be as we were yesterday. Now, now is the music. Dance now, Miriam. Dance as I do. Dance! Peasants of the Campania whirl to the maddened music. Wilder and wilder, the wide skirts flashing in the sun. The ribbons dancing with light. Music going faster and faster. The wild ring of mirth spreads clear across the glade as a sculptured scene of gaiety upon an antique sarcophagus. And so in mirth, in gaiety, there is always doom and sorrow. And as the revel grows to highest frenzy, the darkness claims its own. Miriam, there in the shadows. It is he, the dark one, the stranger. It must end here, Donatello. No, no. Let me go. Let me go to the shadows where he waits for me. Our hour as nymph and fawn is ended. Miriam. Go and look not behind you. Who is it? Who is it that stands in the shadow beckoning? Who is he? Hush, leave me. Your hour is past. His has come. I hate him. I hate the dark catacomb he came from. I hate the steps he takes to haunt you. Be satisfied. I hate him, too. Then shall I clutch him by the throat? Shall I kill him, Signorina? Let me do so, and we are rid of him forever. In heaven's name, no violence. Have pity on me, Donatello. Forgive me this one wild hour. Follow me no further. Not follow you? Signorina, what other path have I? Make me not more wretched by remembrance of having thrown fears, hates, or loves into your happy life. Leave me now, Donatello, leave me. I must speak with him. You follow me too closely. Do you know what will be the end of this? I know well what must be the end. Tell me then. My foreboding is dark. You must vanish. Throw off your mask and leave no trace in Rome. It is in my power to compel you to my bidding. You know the penalty. For me, there is another penalty. Death. Simply death. Oh, you are strong and warm with life. You have tried, but you cannot die. You cannot escape me thus. I pray that we might die. Both die and there be peace. Never. You have brought me back into the world, and you will obey my bidding. Then the end is death. I. Men have said that white hand was once stained with blood. You, you at least have no right to think me murderous. Mm, it is a white hand, but I have known hands as white which all the water in the ocean would not have washed clean. No, Miriam. We met again in the grave of the earth. We would meet again in desert or on the lonely mountain top. You shall not escape me. <laughs> And from this height, Hilda, you can see across the Via Borghese to the Tiber. Kenyon, look there, at the edge of the wood. The man? Is it not Donatello walking alone, so forlorn? Donatello? Yes, yes it is. But so sad, I've never seen him so. <laughs> really, Hilda, I'm afraid our friend is no true form. Did you think him so too? <laughs> ah, why, dear Hilda, Donatello is a Tuscan born. 
a noble of an ancient race. He is master of a tower in the Apennines. We've thought of him as one of us, but if we paid due respect, we'd reverence him as the Conde de Montebene. Donatello, a count? Donatello, stop. He's looking back. It's Miriam. And the beggar, the model. Who is she, Hilda? Miriam confides in you. Who is this stranger? She says nothing, Kenyon. But she's afraid of him. Look. Look, she kneels at the fountain. She kneels before him. She kneels to reach the water. No. No, look at her ring her hands. She's in some sad dream, imprisoned in an iron cage. With that dark stranger, her turnkey. Is not the fountain stained with your hand, Miriam? Leave me. Will not the red flow down to the Tiber and then to the sea? My hand was not so stained before you clasped it. Signorina. In the name of all the saints, banish demon, leave me. Never, never, Miriam. Signorina. Never. You have brought me to the sun again. I shall follow after you. Bid me drown him, Signorina, but say, and you shall hear his death gurgle in another instant. Peace, peace, Donatello. Do him no hurt. He is mad. I hate him, Signorina. He hurts you. Hush, hush, boy. I have changed, Signorina, since I know you. Now I've lost my reed pipe. Feel my hand. It's so hot. And my heart burns hotter. Poor Donatello, you are ill. Go back to your hills, foolish one. Is there anything in Rome which is worth the life you led before? Yes, Signorina, yes. The burning pain in my heart, for you are in the midst of it. Donatello, wild youth, get back to your vineyards, your olive orchards in the hills. Live happily as your fathers did. There is a great evil hanging over me. Go, go lest it crush you too. You cannot drive me from you. Donatello, poor simple boy. Tomorrow I must tell you all. I must make you hate me and send you off. What a sin to stain your joyous nature with the blackness of a woe like mine. High above the Roman city is that cliff from which the traitors to the ancient state were hurled to death upon the rocks of the Tiber flood. Here in the moonlight, the roofs of the city stretch out below. A long, misty wreath, just dense enough to catch the light, floats above the winding line of the Tiber. And the dome of St. Peter's gleams as though it were a second moon. Oh, what a beautiful view of the city. Have you been here before, Miriam? No, never. Look over the parapet. (gasps) Oh! (laughs) Still a deadly fall. Think, Hilda, think. Here, many a Roman took his last look at a city. It is cold. Let us go, Signorina. The mist rises, bringing the malaria. Come, it is midnight. Too late to be dreaming on the edge of a precipice. Coming, Miriam? Go on without me, Kenyon. But, Miriam... Donatello will stay with me. Forever, Signorina. Very well. Come, Hilda. Careful on the cobbles. It's cold, Signorina. Won't you come away, please? Now, mind the gate, Hilda. No. Wait, Kenyon. What is it? I must go back. No, don't come with me. I'm afraid for Miriam. There's some sorrow, something that she might find relief in telling me. But, Hilda... Go on. Donatello will see us home. Please, Kenyon. Well, take care, dearest Hilda. I shan't be long. It would be a fatal fall still, Donatello. How soon it would be over. I'll wait till they're done. Oh, Miriam, poor soul. Who are they, Signorina? who have been flung over this cliff in days gone by? Men whose lives poisoned their fellows. Was it well done? It was well done. The innocent were guarded by the destruction of the evil. Signorina, there, see there by the wall. What is it, Donatello? He's there again, the ghost, the pagan. He haunts you still. I and will forever. No, 
Miriam. No. Tell him. No, no more. Tell him. Now, demon. You will hurt her no more. Uh, loose me, you mad fool. Don't tell him. Now. Don't now I have him over the traitor's cliff. Shall he die, Signorina? Shall he die? Don't tell him. Go then back to the earth. Go. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, save us. Done. I did what your eyes bade me when I held him over the cliff. Your eyes commanded me. No. No, you have killed him, Donatello. Oh, what did it for I? He had his trial in that breast when I held him over the cliff. His sentence in your eyes when they answered mine. Oh, Miriam, say that he died with your consent or I shall join him on the stones below. No, Donatello, you spoke the truth. My heart consented. We slew him, the two. The deed knots us together for time and eternity. Like the coil of a serpent. I... I feel it. Miriam, we draw one breath. We live one life. No more loneliness, my innocent one. Cast it behind you. We are cemented in his blood. His death exists no more. The NBC University Theater is bringing you Miss Lynn Barry in a radio version of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Marble Fawn. This play is part of a series devoted to the classic novels of Anglo-American literature. If you're interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And now, our intermission commentator, Mr. Mark Van Doren, Pulitzer Prize-winning poet and professor of English at Columbia University. Speaking from New York, here is Mr. Mark Van Doren. The Marble Fawn is Hawthorne's last completed romance. But its dominant idea is such as to suggest that it might have been the first tale told by him or any other man. The moral setting of the book is as old as Paradise Lost or the Book of Genesis. The story is of how a primitive and innocent spirit undergoes the alteration necessary to make him a member of human society as we have known it since the fall of Adam. Donatello, the young Italian nobleman who looks so much like the fawn of Praxiteles, and who under his curls may conceal a pair of ears that would prove the resemblance more than merely amusing, is by no means young in the world, for his ancestry goes back forever, and the tower he lives in looks out upon a landscape which the centuries have not changed. But in the human world, he is a newcomer who has yet to be initiated in the experiences which for Hawthorne define us as men and women. He has yet to know sorrow, suffering, sin, and guilt. For better or worse, these are the things that mature us, that educate us in the morality of which we are so proud. Donatello has no soul until he has sinned. The crime which all but marries him to Miriam, the beautiful and tragic woman of this world who has tried to keep him from her, is also the means by which Hilda, the New England girl, who is Miriam's friend in Rome, attains to all the human understanding of which she is capable. In a sense, this is true of Kenyon, too, the American sculptor who loves Hilda for the very reason that she has no power to imagine evil. The murder of the mysterious model is thus the heart and meaning of Hawthorne's romance. All of the action leads to it or away from it. It may have been inescapable, but its consequences will live forever, not only in Miriam and Donatello, but in the puritanical Americans who suffer at second remove. The dark and beautiful story of the marble fawn takes place in a gay city of carnivals whose music provides an ironic background for what we hear and see happening to the four principals. There is dancing in the streets as the terrible beauty of a new soul is born. Hawthorne had been in Rome and seen this merriment with his own eyes. Only with his imagination, however, did he ever see what goes on at the center of his work. The city where it goes on is Rome almost a century ago, but the meaning is not dated. 
It is Hawthorne's creation for all time. Thank you, Mr. Van Doren. Our radio version of The Marble Fawn, starring Lynn Berry, will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. of the Capuchins in Rome stands a little aside from the Piazza Barberini. And there on the morning after the Traitor's Rock came Miriam and Donatello. For the ordinary aspect of life, the commonplace appointment is kept so carefully when a guilty secret weighs on the mind. How sick and tremulous the spirit in the daylight, which has dared so much the night before. How faintly does the criminal stagger onward, lacking the fire, the passion that carried him into guilt. Here. Here, Miriam. On the steps. Good morning, Kenny. Good morning, Miriam. Donatello? Senor? Is Hilda not coming? You saw her safely home last night. No. I have not seen her since we parted. She went back to the cliff to rejoin you. Impossible. You did not see her then? I I'm afraid that... Do not fear, Senor. I saw her at her tower this morning, feeding the flocks of doves as she always does. She's safe, Senor. Oh, well, then, Hilda has forgotten her appointment with us. She'll meet us later. Is it the uh, frescoes on the church wall you wish to show us, Kenyon? And the sculpture. Well, come along, then, into the church. See, Miriam, each shrine has its carved saint. Are they not magnificent? And the mosaic in the floor. Kenyon, what is that before the altar? That, that beer? One of the Capuchin monks. He lies in state before burial. No, it is a statue. Oh, Signorina. What is the matter, Donatello? You're in a tremble. The awful music from beneath the church. The air is so heavy with it, I can scarcely draw my breath. From yonder dead monk. He seems to lie across my heart. Take courage, Donatello. Come, we will go to him. The only way is to stare the ugly horror right in the face. Come. I, I'm afraid, Signorina. Of the dead brother. See, his rosary is in his hand. He is just as in life. There is nothing to fear. Signorina! Signorina, the face! The shadow is deeper. Oh! My God! What is this? It is he, Signorina! It is he, the specter! Oh. Look! He no. bleeds! He bleeds again. The blood seeks out his murderer. Oh, Signorina. Oh. Go back to Kenyon. Leave me with him. Go. Oh, Signorina, come away. Is it thou indeed? Thou hast no right to scowl upon me so. Art thou real or a vision? There is the scar I knew so well. It is no vision. No. No, thou shalt not scowl me down. Neither now nor when we stand together at the judgment seat. I fear not to meet thee there. Farewell to that next encounter. Here, sweet bird. There. I know you've come to my window for me to feed you once again. Here. Gently now. Hilda. What? Miriam. I didn't see you enter. Here is Hilda. It gives me new life to see you. No. Don't come nearer, Miriam. Hilda, are we not friends? No. No. We were. I loved you dearly. I... I love you still. And will you not touch my hand? Am I not the same as yesterday? No. No, Miriam, please. Hilda, what have you seen or known of me since we last met? Miriam. Miriam. A terrible thing. Is it written in my face or painted in my eyes? 
Did all Rome see it? Is there some blood stain on me or death scent in my clothing? I went back, Miriam. Back to the cliff. I saw you and Donatello and... And I know not who. You knelt to him. And Donatello sprang. It, it was like a flash of lightning. A look passed from your eyes to Donatello's. A look. A look, Hilda? It reveals your heart. Hatred, triumph, vengeance, joy. And then... No more. No more, Hilda. It is a terrible secret to be kept in a young girl's heart. What will you do with it? It crushes me to earth, Miriam. I... I must let it out of my heart or it will burst it asunder. It will not help you to bear testimony in courts of law about this. Hilda, you would know that justice cannot be done me here on earth. Have you no other friend? Kenyon. I cannot tell him, Miriam. He loves you dearly. Oh, Miriam, I... I cannot betray you to justice. I must keep your secret. But I shall die of it. Oh, Miriam, your deed has darkened the whole sky. The tower of Donatello in the wild hills of the Apennines stood square and ancient, bearded with ivy, pierced with loopholes where bowmen of the years gone by had shot their arrows at besieging enemies. The vineyards covered the steep hills and the twisted olive trees stood clear against the sky. Here on the summit of the tower were Donatello and the sculptor Kenyon. I thank my forefathers for building the tower so high. I like the windy summit better than the world below. <laughs> I thought that you would spend your time in pagan life, tasting rich figs and sampling the fresh-paid wine. I have known such a life <laughs> when I was a boy. The time flies over us, but leaves its shadow behind. But the stables, Donatello, the vineyards, surely this was a gay and merry patriarchy. I am the last of my line. They have all vanished from me since my childhood. Then you must allow me to model a portrait bust of you, so that the coming generations may remember. No. No, I... I it troubles me to be looked at steadily. Only... Well, you may not uncover these ears of mine. <laughs> no fear, Donatello. I remember how you stood by the marble fawn in the gallery and Miriam tried to shake away those curls. You mentioned her name. Tell me... Tell me all you know of her. She has left Rome. The studio is vacant. I do not know where she is. So... I was happy in this tower as a child. Kenyon, let me tell you the legend of my family. The race of Montebene. It is said my eldest forefather was in truth a fawn of the woods. And in the years before the Christ, before almost the world itself... He found on this spot a spring of crystal water, and dwelling in it a nymph. They loved each other, and lived in the sparkling water through the golden ages. She taught him how to call her from the silver water. But then, one day, he came upon the spring all hurried and fevered. He called upon the nymph, but she came not. And then he flung himself down and bathed his hands in the water. The water shrank away and left his hands as dry and feverish as before. He had tried to wash away a blood stain, a guilty blood stain. And he never saw his nymph again. I used to call that nymph when I was young. And sometimes I fancied she would answer. I could call the birds and the little folk of the forest and they would come. But no more. Donatello. What has happened to you? Death. Death. They know it. All nature shrinks from me. Oh, Donatello. Here, come away from the battle. No, no, don't worry, friend Kenyon. I...
cling to life in a way you cannot conceive. And to fall from a precipice is such an awful death. If it be a great height, a man would leave life in the air and never feel his fall. No. No, imagine a fellow creature, now breathing, looking you in the face, and then falling down, 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 with a shriek wavering after him. His life keeps in him till he crashes against the stones, and he lies there, a frightfully quiet, dead heap of bruised flesh and broken bones. A quiver runs through the crushed mass, and then no more. Can you? Would I could endure it, and so dream it no more. Senor, Senor Kenyon. What is it, Tomas? Is the master still on the tower? Yes, he is. Good. Then the Signorina would speak with you. The Signorina? Yes, Senor. She waits outside now. I go now and bring her. Wait, Tommaso. Who is it? It is I, Kenyon. Miriam. Donatello isn't with you. No. Miriam, you look very ill. What is wrong? There is nothing left to me, Kenyon. Nothing left but to brood, brood, brood. This is very sad, Miriam. Indeed. I fancy so. It is not remorse, Kenyon. I feel neither regret nor penitence. But to know that Donatello must forever find me an object of horror. No, no. Miriam, he loves you still. Is he much changed? Yes, he is changed. He startles me with perception of deep truths. Out of his bitter agony, a soul and intellect have been inspired into him. He will reject me, Kenyon. I love him, but I am in great dread of Donatello. Once he shuddered at my touch, if he should shudder again, I would die. Miriam, we must somehow remove Donatello from this seclusion in which he buried himself. We must bring him back to be the wild fawn he was once. Well, what is your plan, then? To take him with me through the hills and valleys here in a trip of several weeks. Kenyon, do you remember the statue of Pope Julius in the square of Perugia? I do. I remember standing there one day just as the sun cast the shadow of the Holy Father's hand across my heart. And I fancied a blessing fell upon me then. At the end of your tour, a fortnight from now, bring Donatello at noon to the base of that statue. You will find me there. The hills and valleys of Tuscany have a wild, ancient aspect. And the two men wandered through them in the warm, sunny daylight hours and slept under the stars at night. Then, when two weeks passed, they made their way to the town of Perugia. It was market day, and the square was crowded with the peasants of the countryside come to sell and buy. But one figure stood alone at the foot of the brazen giant that was Pope Julius. A figure dark, shrouded in cloth. A woman with her head sunk in her hand. Miriam, is it yourself? It is I. You are most welcome. Come, let me lead you to Donatello. He stands over there. No, can you know? Unless of his own accord he speaks my name. Miriam, are you afraid? He must decide himself. Take your own course. But have you heard news of Hilda? We have no word from Rome. She is not ill, Kenyon, but she is alone. I fear for her health that she must live in that way much longer. I must leave immediately, then. No, wait. Donatello comes this way. I cannot speak to him. Donatello? Has he no word for me? Miriam? Miriam? You have called me. My deepest heart has need of you. Oh, Miriam, forgive the coldness with which I parted from you. Donatello, you were so gifted with the power of sunny life. And it was my doom to bring you within the limits of sinful, sorrowful mortality. Miriam, we must be together. Is it not so? United by a bond of guilt. We will find misery, my love, 
And yet we must be together. Mary. I cannot understand this trembling at the marriage barn as though it were a crime. But now I must to Rome for Hilda. Farewell, then, Kenyon. May you be happy. You have no guilt to make you shrink from happiness. And at that moment, high above, the sun cast down a shadow of the giant bronze statue. The outstretched hand of the ancient pope spread its image across the three. Donatello, Kenyon, Miriam, all looked up and felt the bronze pontiff suddenly endowed with spiritual life. And as they stood under his protecting hand, they felt the union of the two blessed most mysteriously. Now, through the ancient streets of Rome, Hilda wandered, her mind tormented, her soul weary. The horrible secret of Donatello's deed weighed heavily upon the daughter of the Puritans. The galleries, the great paintings lost their enchantment. The vast canvases of Raphael, the divine murals of Fra Angelico, brought no rest. Now, Hilda climbed the broad steps of the great cathedral of St. Peter. She was a child of hard New England, and yet this Puritan maid stood before the great carved statue of the Virgin and remembered that in the small white wooden churches of her girlhood, this was an idol, a symbol of idolatry. But why should there not be a woman to listen to the prayers of women? In all God's thought and care for us, can he have withheld this boon? Down the long open aisle she walked, the floor paved in faded mosaics the vast ceiling arching up to the gloom above her. Now in the south transept she came upon the confessionals where those of the Roman faith may fling down their dark burdens at the foot of the cross and go forth to sin no more and to live again in the freshness and elasticity of innocence. Then she came upon that dark shadowy booth marked Pro Anglica Lingua, the confessional for those of the English tongue. Oh, I cannot bear it. Oh, Father, Father, help me. I must speak. I must. I am here to listen, my daughter. Say on. I, I have seen a horrible crime. A sin, Father. A man flung, dashed off a cliff to his death. I cannot keep it within my heart. Oh, Father, help me. Help me. Her heart's burden burst forth as a stream until the whole horrible tale, barring the names of Miriam and Donatello, was out at last. Father, I feel as if some torture had stopped. I feel free. My child, what I must say to you, my daughter, must be spoken face to face. Yes, Father? It has not escaped me that this is your first experience with a confessional. How is this? Father, I am of New England birth. My people are what you call heretics. Then how have you sought the blessed privilege of absolution? Absolution? Oh, no, no, I never dreamed of that. Only our Heavenly Father can grant me that, not mortal man. Father, I know no one here in Rome, and I could not bear to carry this secret longer... It seemed as if I made the awful guilt my own by keeping it hidden in my heart. But, daughter, the seal of the confessional cannot apply to you. It must be my duty to make your story known to the proper authority. No. No, that can't be right. I came to your confessional to put my heart in God's hands. Peace. Peace, my little countrywoman. There is no need for me to reveal your secret. If I do not mistake me, what you have told me is known already to the governors of Rome. What then? Hush. You have no responsibility for this dark act. Let it trouble you no longer. Father, I'm a daughter of the Puritans. I will come no more to the confessional. But you have done me a great Christian kindness. I shall not forget. I cannot bless you in the name of the church, my daughter. But kneel now. And I shall wish you God's mercy as a man. It was
was the carnival time in Rome when Kenyon found Helga, free of her terrible secret as never she had been before. And together they went upon the city streets, crowded with merrymakers, and wandered through the torchlight and leaping shadows. The maskers and merrymakers swirled through the Roman streets. But near the pedestal that surrounds the ancient marble column of the Emperor Trajan stood two solemn figures. Clad as penitents, with wide, deep hoods casting black shadows across their faces, stood Miriam and Donatello. And to them, through the crowd, came Hilda and Kenyon. Miriam! Miriam! Donatello! Kenyon! Hilda, do you remember Carnival last year? Were we not happy? It seems so many years ago. We're all so changed. But shall we not dance again as we did that time? Come, Donatello. One more day of the wild fawn life of old. Black reality will be on us soon enough. The time is short, Miriam. Oh, I do not understand, Miriam. Your veil of mystery grows dimmer. Nay, then let me dispel it altogether. I am of the Fenici, the ancient line that mingled with the Borgias three centuries ago. My mother was English. My father's family rules in southern Italy. But, Miriam, why hide such a noble parentage? I was betrothed when I was seven to an older man of an ancient line. Oh, horrible. Not so. Most Italian girls of noble rank would yield to such a marriage as an affair, of course. But recollection of my English mother stirred me to rebellion. And when I came of age, I determined to repudiate the contract. For my proposed husband was evil, treacherous, tainted with the insanity which appears in old, close-kept races of men. You can judge. You have all seen his face. What? No, Miriam. Yes, hear me longer. Before I made public my repudiation, my father died. Poisoned. Oh, no. And my betrothed was to be his heir. Suspicion fell on both of us. He is poisoner, I as accomplice. For the poison was the ancient one of Lucrezia Borgia, a secret handed down through our family. The authorities. The old families of great wealth are above the law here in Italy. But I determined to flee, to lose myself. And so I came to Rome as an artist. But your betrothed, the... Poisoner? Yes, he was guilty. But you said we had seen him. You have. In the catacomb. In the studio on the cliff. And then still upon his bier in the church of the Capuchins. The stranger. It was he. After the scandal of the poisoning, he fled to the Capuchin Fathers and lived many years in penance in the catacomb. But when I met him there, he followed me, threatening to denounce me to the world as poisoner till Donatello... Do not speak of it again, Miriam. One word could have blasted me before you all. Hilda, Donatello, all would have shrunk from no, me. No, no. We would have acquitted you, Miriam. Miriam, the carnival is almost over. Shall we dance now? The time grows short. Look at him, Kenyon. See the traces of the old fawn return yet with the treasure of improvement won from pain. The story of the fall of man. Mark it all within Donatello. Miriam! Was it not that very sin of Adam which has destined his race through toil and sorrow to reach a higher happiness than our lost birthright? Mark this in Donatello. He is the story of us all. Miriam, the time grows short. The carnival is almost over. In a moment, Fawn. More than Fawn. But gay hearts meant only for enjoyment. Have they no place on our earth today? Has life grown now so sad that man must change? Look at him, Kenyon. Look at Donatello and ask, is sin, like sorrow, merely an element of human education which we must pass through to reach our higher goal? Miriam, I cannot follow you. The mind wanders far and wide, Kenyon, and up to the stars. And there is justice only in heaven. We'll wait no longer, Fawn. Come, dance. Dance. For the hour grows short. Come, Miriam, once more. One short day. Come, Donatello, creature of the wood grown wise. This hour is our triumph. Tomorrow is dark, but today is the carnival, and we must dance. And so into the world went Miriam. Her freedom, cruelty, rather than mercy. For though her crime lay but in a glance, yet the years of sharp remorse would harry her around the world, as did the dark stranger through the streets of Rome. 
Ask no more for Miriam. She is at last at rest. And Donatello, wild youth who stood once beside the marble fawn as before a mirror. In Italy, the dungeons of the prisons lie deep beneath the ground, the damp cold air so far from the open vinelands, the shadowy woodland glens. Here, in expiation for the sin, the fall that brought the soul and intellect, here lies our Donatello. And on his grief-furrowed face, in his deep, weary, soul-filled eyes, there is no sign or lingering trace of that wild creature he once so resembled, the marble fawn. have been listening to The Marble Fawn, an NBC University Theater production of the Nathaniel Hawthorne novel, starring Miss Lynn Barry as Miriam. Next week, at the same time, we will bring you another classic of Anglo-American literature, Henry Esmond by William Thackeray. The present semester of the NBC University Theater is devoted to the classics of Anglo-American literature from the time of Henry Fielding to that of Henry James. If you wish, you may learn more about these authors and their works by enrolling in the college-supervised courses now being offered in connection with the NBC University Theater, the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma, Washington State College, and Kansas State Teachers College have now completed their plans for offering such a course in the coming months, thus joining the University of Louisville, whose established home study plan is already serving listeners in another area of the nation. For information, then, as to how you may enhance your knowledge through these courses, write to the NBC University Theater, in care of the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, the University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas. Let me repeat that. For information, write to the NBC University Theater. In care of the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, the University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas. <laughs> The Marble Fawn was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy with Mark Van Doren. Miss Lynn Barry, star of screen and radio. And the narrator was High Aberbach. Our cast included Jane Webb, Don Dyer, Jan Arvin. The score was composed and conducted by Dr. Albert Harris. The University Theater is Andrew C. Week. Be with us again for the NBC University Theater dramatization of the William Thackeray novel, Henry Esmond. Starring Edmund O'Brien. This program came to you from Hollywood's Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.